Hi there, welcome back. Well, we've come very far on this one. And um, you might notice that some cleaning has been done. As I've mentioned before in my videos, it's not my favorite activity, but it's certainly one of the most important ones. Because these radios usually come in with a fair amount of dust and cobwebs and insects and everything else you can imagine. So cleaning is essential. I actually left this one quite late. Usually I do the cleaning of parts as I do the restoration of those parts. But this time I was doing this in a little bit of a different order with a lot more detail. So I've left it to last. I get asked all the time um, just how I do the cleaning and it's very simple. Um, I try and use just isopropyl alcohol. And what I do is I brush it on with a uh, natural bristle brush which is a little bit more, um, has a little bit more uh, grab to it. So it sort of has a scrubbing action. And then I go over it or wipe out the residue with um, some swabs or some um, cotton wool or even uh, makeup removing pads. But um, this one, there are a few things here that I could have gone into a little bit more intensely like the tuning condenser has some marks on it but that is not dirt that means I would that would mean I would have to repaint it and I don't want to do that I want to leave this as original as possible the circuit boards come out clean it's um, a lot of the marking there is just from age so I decided to leave that and I'm actually quite happy with the result These guys are now done. All it took was some uh, dishwashing liquid and um, an old toothbrush. And then the polishing, that takes quite a while. You should actually leave it in the liquid for a while and then it comes off quite easily. The uh, polishing at the top was done with the Dremel and a, um, a little tool that I made and I'll show you a video above. It makes those units cost you about five cents each. And it comes out bloody well. Now, another little detail is the trimming on here. These edges usually come with some cloth tape just to protect it where it fits into the uh, radio, into the car, into the chassis. And they came off. Uh, they usually come off. Sometimes they've rotted away or they just peel off. And what I've started using, and it's actually quite a good... Um, replacement because I think it's probably what they had in the first place is this cloth surgical plaster it's actually a cloth plaster which uh, you use for um, yeah well for cuts and scrapes and so on and you can still get this instead of getting those elastoplast things or plastic ones so um, I just uh, cut it trim it around and the next thing to do is to paint it black because the um, original one was black and I think it may have to do with it possibly shining through the front. We don't want that. And with the magic of a permanent magic marker or blackboard uh, marker, whiteboard marker, whatever you want to call it, the result is there. You ever try to get the stuff off your clothes? Well, yeah, you won't get it off that either. 
Perfect. And uh, the faceplate itself cleaned up beautifully. Again, with um, some uh, liquid, uh, wash up liquid and a cloth with great care on the reverse side in case uh, any of the paint comes off. You should actually test it in a small corner first, but this one came out perfectly. You do have to clean the back because those um, transparent sections you will see through, so it's always a good idea to get that clean as well. And here it is, in place, and it's done. You have to be very careful with those tighteners. You tighten it just enough so that it grabs onto the cloth, uh, onto that uh, plaster border because if you squeeze it too much, you can break it. Everything has got to be on, put on very gently. And our front plate is done. Good. More stuff to do. It's time to do the alignment on this thing. I want to do the IF alignments. And um, if you recall that second page that I showed you uh, when I showed you the schematics, Fortunately, this second page gives us all the information we need. I'll give you a closer look. This is all in German, but it's pretty self-explanatory once you've done a few. And if we look here, we've got the AM alignment, AM IF alignment at 460 kilohertz. And it tells us quite a few things, even without understanding all the German. You set it on medium wave, you tune it to approximately 600 kilohertz. That doesn't really matter. It's best if you're not picking up a station there. Then it says Gitter 1 EF89. So you're going to inject the signal into the grid of the EF89. And you're going to tune coils 27 and 26 to get a maximum. Now this basically means that... Um, you, you feed a 460 kilohertz carrier signal, pretty low voltage, very low. I'll show you in a minute. You uh, modulate it with an audible signal, let's say 600 hertz, about 30% modulation. And then you listen or measure the output level at the speaker. And you tune these two coils till you get the maximum output level. Now you can do it in various ways. You can actually listen by ear and tune it by ear till you get the maximum signal, or, as I prefer to do, instead of using a speaker, I put a dummy load in place of the speaker, and I measure the result, the output on an oscilloscope, and use that as the uh, indication. What you're doing here with the EF89 first, it's the tube before the last um, IF transformer, so you're going backwards in the circuit from the output back to the input. This is important, especially if you have no signal. If these things were completely out of tune, you may not find it if you put it right at the beginning. However, we normally can. So what I normally do, I will connect the signal to the uh, grid of the ECH81, which happens to be pin 2, and I will tune these four, rather these two IF transformers for a maximum. So. 27 and 26 is tuned together, 20 and 19 are tuned together, and you get a maximum. What you're doing here in the last one is you're actually um, feeding the signal into the antenna input, and you are going to tune coil 10 for a minimum. Now this coil 10 is right by the antenna input, and it's the IF trap. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to avoid any external signals at 460 kilohertz from going into the radio and messing up your um, your normal operation of uh, basically creating a difference of, uh, of uh, frequency of 460 kilohertz between the input signal and the oscillator. So you don't want external um, signals coming in at the frequency of the IF. Now I'm going to show you this in a little bit of detail but a lot of the detail is actually right on here. If you look a bit further up, this part of the drawing gives us the locations of these um, coils and everything we need to know. 
if we look at it from the top as we do in this uh, in this one and we look for the ones we've just mentioned the coils we've just mentioned for the uh, media uh, for the AM IF alignment it was 19 and 20 26 and 27 now we've got 19 there 26 there the opposites are underneath so you actually you will find a hole on the underside and it shows you here where they are this is now obviously looking from the underside so you're going to tune 19 and 20 26 and 27 and if you you'll notice that the 19 and 20 are the ones furthest to the front and in this particular case 20 20 and 27 are the ones furthest to the front so they will be directly above each other so we know now that the two coils on the IF transformers, the two coils that are furthest into the radio are the AM and that obviously means that the two that are further to the back, closest to the back, these two and those two, so um, what is this, 23 and 21 and 25 and 22 are the FM. We will leave these alone for now. We'll only focus on the AM section and do the alignment on that one. So let me set this up and explain it to you and get going. So we'll start by setting the frequency to 460 kilohertz. That's our carrier signal. Our amplitude, we're going to make very, very small. In fact, we're going to make it as small as we can. Um, and in this particular case, the smallest we can get is 1.4 millivolts RMS. So that's set to the lowest it can be. We then do... Uh, we click the modulation button here and we're going to choose the type is AM modulation the uh, source is internal internal the depth is 30 percent and the actual audible frequency that we want is let's say 600 Hertz it could be 1 kilohertz it could be 400 it could be whatever you really want that you can hear clearly so that signal now is modulated what we have is a carrier signal at 1.4 millivolts rms coming out of this thing when i activate the output 460 kilohertz carrier signal modulated with a 600 kilohertz audible tone at 30 percent modulation now when i activate this here it should come out of there however this 1.4 millivolts rms is sometimes still too high so I've got a trick for that and you can do this in various ways. This one is mine. I have built an attenuator. This attenuator is uh, going to take the signal and attenuate it by a certain number of dBs depending on which ones I activate. At the moment they're all set to zero so there's no attenuation between that point and that point or negligible attenuation. Okay. This says AC coupled. It means that there's actually a capacitor between the output there and the signal going through here. And the reason for that is we don't want DC to either go into the radio or back. If we have a short over there, if we have a fault over there and we touch it, we don't want high voltage DC coming back into the signal generator. But I can also then click that one there and I get 60B or that one and I get 12DB or that one and I get 18 dB of attenuation. I can also add them so I can actually if I want 18 dB I can choose that one. If I want 24 dB I can add that 6 to it. If I want to add another 12 to it I can do that so I've got uh, 30, 36 dB of attenuation. If I take off the 18 I've got 18. If I've got just the one there it's a 6 dB attenuation 12 dB attenuation. So basically the whole thing gives me a fair number of options as to how much I can attenuate the signal before I send it in to the uh, to the grids of those two tubes or the one tube as I'm going to do now. The other thing is this is a 50 ohm output and this is a 50 ohm um, attenuator and these things are very easy to build. You can go onto the net, you can find calculators that tell you exactly uh, what resistor values, this is basically just resistor values on here, resistors on here, and switches, and they'll describe exactly how you build this thing. It's very, very simple and very, very useful. 
Now you can actually get attenuators that fit in line with the B and C's, so you don't have to flick around like that. And it's probably a little bit more sturdy than mine, because this thing is plugged in there and plugged in there. But this one's done the job a lot of times, and I'm very, very happy with the result. Next thing to do is to take the signal from here, and here it is on the clips. I'm going to connect the negative to ground, probably just a chassis point. And this one here, I'm going to actually remove the ECH81, and I'm going to stick that little thingy there into the pin 1. I think it's pin 1. I'll have to just check. Of the ECH81. It's the grid of the ECH81. And then I'll be ready to set things up to detect the output. So as described, we've now got the signal generator sending its signal to the first grid of that ECH81. It's actually pin 2 on there. And when I switch on the, the radio, and it is switched on now, I've set it to about 600 kilohertz here on medium wave. It's not that important. It's just important that you don't have a strong station over there. That'll mess you up. And I've switched on the signal generator and we've got everything set to zero on the attenuator. And listen to this. There's our signal. Now, it is still too strong because if I put up the volume, it really does blast. What I need to do is I need to keep that signal just strong enough that you can detect it as an audio signal, but not too strong that it gets the AGC working crazy, like crazy over there. The AGC is the automatic gain control, and what it does is it basically will produce a uh, DC voltage that will regulate the gain of the various stages of tubes. In other words, if you've got a very strong signal, it'll reduce the gain of the preceding stages to make it a little bit weaker. And if you've got a weak signal, it'll let the gain of the previous stages stay quite high and make the results a little bit stronger. Automatic gain control, right? So we need to make this signal as small as possible. But as I said, this doing this with, uh, with a signal uh, audible is a pain in the butt. So I prefer to put a uh, load resistor on there. And that load is made up of these two uh, high wattage resistors. This is at 8.2 ohms at 10 watt in parallel with a uh, 15 ohm at 17 watt. That gives us about 5.6 ohms, which is about the impedance of the, uh, of the speakers these old radios generally use. So I use this over here and uh, it's basically providing the load for the output for the output transformer and not uh, messing up my ears at the same time. And now we've got the scope connected to there. One has to be very careful you don't mix up the negatives and positives because the negative is common negative with the uh, chassis where I've connected the negative of the uh, signal generator. So I don't want to create uh, shorts and blow up my equipment, especially the scope. If you don't know about that, go and look at some of the uh, videos on that, how to blow up your oscilloscope by uh, creating short circuits or uh, ground loops. But anyway, we've got the signal generator or the output of the radio now connected to the scope. And if we look at the scope, we've got the signal coming in. It's uh, reading here 1.42 volts peak to peak. It's uh, just under half a volt RMS. 600, well, just flipping around a little bit on 600, which is the modulated signal. And as you can see, it's a very, very strong signal. Basically, it's driving this thing to its max. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the intensity or the uh, amplitude by um, adding attenuation. I've got 2 volts RMS there, far too much. I've added 6 dB of attenuation, 1.45, still too much. I'll add another 12. Now I've got 18 dB of attenuation. It's sort of, yeah, it's still visible as a... Um, I've got the volume on maximum, that's the idea, because you're basically listening to the output. Now, I can see this as a sine wave. To make it easier to read, I can acquire with some averaging. 
not too much. If I do too much averaging, then any change I make, it makes the uh, wave look great, but any change I make will take too long to reflect on the, uh, on the signal here and I'll miss it. So I normally give it four. That should do it. I could always just, um, just give it a little bit more amplitude there. And then I can reduce the, uh, or increase the attenuation again once I've got it set to where I want it to be. Now, just as a reference, um, we've got with um, 6 dB of attenuation, sorry, with 12 dB of attenuation, we've got about 800 millivolts. Just as a reference, so we know what we've done uh, and if, we, if we've improved anything uh, as we go along. Now, how do we tune these things? Well, again, very simple. If you recall from the drawing we saw, the two coils we need to tune are that one there, that one there, and their corresponding partners from the underside. So to do that, we need to actually flip this thing on its side so you have access to that one and to the bottom one. So now if you look at the underside, you can see these holes. There's one, goes through the PC board, but we know that the FM is the one closest to the back, so we don't mess with that one yet. The other one is up here, and you have to sort of go around some resistors over here, or capacitors, the wiring to get to that. But that's over there. The other one is over here, and that's the one we're going to tune, and that's the other FM one. Now, you can really see, for various reasons, you can't use a metal screwdriver to adjust these things. The main reason is that these are ferrite cores, and if you use uh, a metal screwdriver, it's going to be a lot stronger than the ferrite itself, and if this thing's a little bit uh, stuck, it'll break and you really don't want to do that. But the other reason is that if you put in a metal screwdriver like this, you're probably going to short something out here because this does touch the components. So it should be plastic or something. I've got the plastic ones, but I actually prefer this thing. This is a kebab stick, and because these um, screws here, or rather the, the thread or the, the hole inside the ferrite core, varies quite dramatically. I'm not sure which ones these are. All I do is I take a kebab stick and I file it down to the approximate shape and see if it works. And that means that if I put on too much force on this thing, the wood breaks and not the ferrite core. It's worked so far, so I'll do it again. Okay, we've got that thing on there. I'm going to start with the one on the underside here. First one on the underside. First, it might take a while to get through the wax that's on there. And we're going to twiddle it one way. Whoa, it's gone up. Got a lot of wax in there. But we have got some increase, increase on that thing there. Try the top one. Well, this thing's going up a lot. I'm going to add 6 dB of attenuation. So we're sitting with 18 dB of attenuation now. Try and peak it now. Now it's going down, so I must go back. That seems to be about it there. Let me try the other one. The other top one. Wrong way. There's a clear peak. There's a clear peak. Brilliant. And now the bottom one, being careful to stick to the AM one, not mixing it with the FM one. Break through the wax. There, that's not a very clear one. There wasn't much change. But we had. Let's put it back to 12 dB. 
And if I recall correctly, we had a much lower amplitude. So we've actually had a positive result. It's gone to 1.04 with 12 dB attenuation. All else the same. I'll have to look back at the video to see what the actual value was. I can't quite remember, but if I'm not mistaken, this is quite an improvement. But there we go. Decrease the volume, increase the volume. This is our signal. And we've basically tuned the IF of the AM. And now for the final test, we'll uh, adjust the uh, IF trap. It's that coil over there, coil 10. Now this thing's got a big blob of um, of wax on there. Now what I've done is I've got the signal coming in, the same 460 kilohertz signal coming in straight to the antenna. I've got the attenuation at zero, so I've got 1.4 millivolts RMS coming in there. It's um, modulated to the 30%, but I'm hearing nothing. I hear the crackle, but no tone. So I'm going to increase the I'm going to increase the amplitude and see what we get. Let's try three millivolts, six millivolts. I'm starting to hear it. It's at eight millivolts. That's really really high. Which means the trap is working very well, obviously. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to go too far on there. So I'm actually going to increase the modulation from 30%, well there we go, 100%. So I've increased the modulation, I can now reduce the amplitude, and I can hear it. Now this one I'm going to have to do by ear, and I have to use this screwdriver because this is really tight. I'm messing with it already, let's try that. Now there it gets louder, I need a minimum. There it gets louder. So that's about where the minimum is. Pretty subjective, but it seems to do the job. And that's it. Our IF trap is done. And there is a little bit more to that, because they actually do suggest that when you are tuning this coil here, you actually short out or shunt out that coil in other words, in this case, you'll be shunting out the FM coil on the same IF transformer with a 5K and 500 picofarads in series to dampen it. Now, basically, what you're trying to do is reduce the effect of the FM coil inside that uh, IF transformer on the tuning of the AM. It does make for more accurate tuning. Well, from my experience, it hasn't um, doesn't make that much difference. So I don't usually do that unless I can't get a, a, a decent peak and unless I find that the uh, sensitivity is unacceptable. But um, we seem to be there. And if we put it on medium wave now... This is... Uh, Late afternoon, so we should get something, but not the best. The best would be in the evening. That is Canary Islands. This is a transmission from the Canary Islands. I'm on the island of Madeira. It's pretty good. Another one from the Canary Islands. All this is Spanish. And that's the only Portuguese channel we have, the one transmitting from the island of Madeira. So yeah, that seems to be working. Long wave, we should get very little. The usual beacon over here. It 
something here on what is this thing about 100 and 175 kilohertz or thereabouts that's it was that something no short wave <laughs> Bloody hell. This is on the 49 meter band. Well, this thing is a very sharp tuning because um, it means that the pass band on the IFs is very, very sharp because it's very, very selective. And you really have a problem actually tuning in because there's such a slight variation here. You're in and out of tuning. You would actually, uh, I've said this before, you could probably do with a band spread here. But uh, as you can see, that's pretty good on uh, on shortwave. Very good, actually. A uh, bit noisy on medium wave because I've got all sorts of crap going on here. I've got a new um, internet extender. I haven't tested the noise on that thing yet, but I'm sure it's sort of helped. And, you know, with everything else on here, it doesn't help. But uh, as you can see on shortwave, I certainly noticed the difference and the improvement. And that's all got to do with that improvement we had there, which went from, uh, as a reference, we had um, 800 millivolts uh, RMS on with a 12 dB attenuation there, and it went to 1 volt, 1.05 or something. So we did get an improvement. And... Um, that part is done. So, there is still the FM alignment to do. There is still the cabinet restoration to do. There's probably still something else to do. I'm sure I'll find something else to do on this thing. There's the um, Bluetooth adapter that I need to put in here. I'm waiting for the boards that I ordered from uh, JLCPCB. Um, so there's still quite a bit to do and we'll take it one step at a time. So, if you've enjoyed this, uh, please subscribe, like, share, uh, do all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel, you can go to Patreon and support the channel there. Thanks very much, and uh, I'll see you back soon. Bye for now.